God bless you, everyone. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Pastor Melly Martinez. Welcome. We're located at 1060 Worcester Street in the Indian Orchard area of Springfield, Massachusetts. Our website is resurrectionspringfield.org, and you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TRC413. And you can subscribe to us on YouTube at ResCent Spring. We're on the KRadio.com, ResurrectionCenterRadio.com, and KTV.us. Today, I'm going to talk about error and greed. Our error leads to greed, and greed leads us into darkness. So the topics of conversation will be 1st of Timothy, chapter 6, verse 1 through 10, which describes what the greed is. We'll be understanding greed, we'll avoid the pitfalls of the riches, and we'll talk about three things about false teachings and what the false teachers cause related to fierce division. And we'll see that the false teachers are victims of greed and that the issues of greed has to do with idolatry. And we'll talk about repentance for correction. So let's talk about greed. Um, let's get a diving into the dirt of greed. So what is greed? Um, well, I have a story about a fence. Uh, we have uh, some brothers of mine at the Resurrection Center. We have uh, Chris O'Brien, he's a homeowner who knows about maintenance. Uh, we know Wayne LaPointe, who is very good with tools. That's why I call him Bunker Bob. And me, of course, I've been a business owner since 1994 and I know how to manage money. And of course, our pastor, Pastor Jose Martinez, he's pretty good at asking questions. So pastor talked with Wayne, Chris, and myself individually, separately. He met with us privately one by one and he wanted to get the best price for a fence. Okay, so Chris O'Brien took out his tape measure and pencil and did some measuring and said, I figured this job will run about $900, uh, 400 uh, for materials, 400 for my crew, you know, the labor, and $100 profit for him, total $900. And Wayne said, the one I call Bunker Bob, he said he also took out his uh, tape measure and pencil and he also did some quick calculations and said, looks like I can do this job for $700, okay? So that's 300 for materials, 300 for the labor and $100 profit for him. Okay, so that's total $700. Finally, pastor asked me for what I thought. And I said, well, I can do it for $2,700. He said, what? You didn't even measure uh, and do any analysis like the other guys. How did you come up with such a high figure of $2,700? I said, it's easy. Uh, $1,000 for you, $1,000 for me, and we'll pay Bunker Bob $700 to do the job. <laughs> so let's uh, get into diving into the dirt of greed, okay? What is greed in the year 2020? Well, part of it is everyone wants it all, okay, because they feel empty. Uh, number two, they're living to excess beyond what they can handle, okay? They just want more and more and more. Uh, sometimes they uh, try to get more by breaking the law. They forget the ethics. Um, they avoid generosity. They forget others, so they're not giving away. Uh, and number five, they gamble a lot. They take a lot of risks. So first of Timothy warns us against greed that destroys us. False teachers promote greed. First of Timothy is one of Paul's three pastoral epistles. Those are letters. We're going to be talking about that today. First of Timothy, second of Timothy, and Titus. Um, they're written to specific people whom Paul is advising on how to best lead their churches. These three letters present a close look at the form and function of church leadership. Of course, today we're focusing on first of Timothy, but chapter six. So Paul's other letters like Romans, Ephesians, and Colossians, all those others, they're meant for a broader audience. So let's look at the book of First of Timothy. The book of First of Timothy is full of very practical advice from Timothy's mentor, 
the Apostle Paul. Chapter 6 rounds out the instructions given in the first five chapters, and we've already talked about those. Building on the ideas laid down earlier in the letter, Paul, the Apostle Paul, reminds Timothy of the importance of godly living and avoiding the snares of evil and temptation. We live in a world of temptation. So this chapter, this chapter 6 of first, uh, first of Timothy, provides strong encouragement for Timothy to apply the wisdom of this letter, both in his personal life and in the churches that he's leading. So let me give you a, just a brief summary from a high level, very basic view of the first six chapters of Timothy. Chapter one, it was Paul's philosophy of the ministry. Chapter two, it's to pray for leaders and godly women. Number three, it talked about the overseers, the deacons, uh, and the conduct in the church. Number four, there was a discussion about the departure from the faith uh, the, and to train for godliness. Number five, it was respectfully challenged, widows and elders. But number six, we're going to be talking about the greed and the error from greed. So today, we're going to talk about how greed has caused error in the doctrines we teach. That means greed is the factory of false teachings in the church. Greed is a distraction. Say distraction. Just like idolatry is a distraction, this is why greed is idolatry. So say idolatry. Today we talk about how greed is the same as idolatry and how idolatry is the factory of false doctrine being taught in churches. Which churches, you ask? Yeah, they're the ones that are closing. Yep, those are the ones, okay? Let me tell you my personal story. I grew up in a world of greed, okay? At seven years old, uh, in 1970, see, I was born in 63, I was drilled the message. At 20 years old, I must make $40,000. At 30 years old, I must make $60,000. At 40 years old, I need to make $80,000. Now, a dollar in 1970 is equivalent, equivalent to about $6.68 in 2020. So what I was really being told was at 20 years old, like when I'm in college, I should be making $267,000. At 30, 000, uh, at 30 years old, I should be making 400,000. And at 40 years old, I should be making 534,000. Uh, uh, well, today I'm 57 years old and I do not make 800,000 a year. Okay, back then, you know, we this is what was drilled into us, how much money we should make, because that was our measurement of success. Okay, it was a ruler. Okay, the struggle to buy a home was real. What it's different than now. Okay, there are many different programs now, um, and and that's perhaps why we had the housing bubble in 2008. But back in my day, um, uh, in the 1980s, 40 percent cash down on a payment on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar home was a requirement. Okay, so it's 40% cash down payment on a $150,000 home. Well, a dollar in 1980 is equivalent in purchasing power to $3.14 in 2020. So in today's dollars, you need to have $190,000 cash down for a $470,000 home, not far away from a half a million dollars. Okay. Um, and you are paying off university education loans for both bachelor's and master's degree. Let me tell you, the struggle was real, okay? Because you're paying off school loans and you're trying to buy a half a million dollar house, okay? For me, I got my master's degree at 24. Uh, so I needed a half a million dollars for the dream, okay? This, is the life, this was the life in 1980s Boston. See, Boston was a factory of greed in the banking and investment industry. I can say that because I worked at corporate headquarters at Bay Bank and Putnam Investments. So I felt that. My father was a famous scientist in history. Google him, Doc Ewan. Uh, he has a PhD from Harvard, 1951. 
and all of the sons wanted to be like dad. It's what we knew. It's what we knew. It was all about money, prestige, and status. I'll say that again. Money, prestige, and status. That's how I was programmed, okay? The colloquial phrase is no money, no honey. I was taught that money built happiness. I believe money makes things possible. For example, education creates the high paying job. I went to Cambridge College. I took classes at Harvard University, postgraduate work after my master's degree. I did all of that. Um, and I found it even to this day that education has a value uh, to me. Um, the title, prestige, that's the nose up in the air. Material things, that's the status, that's the big show off. So prestige and status blinds us from God's purpose. We forget what Jeremiah 29 11 teaches us. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Th Let me tell you, in, in the way I grew up, it was all about prestige and status. Okay, but what God gives us it's not prestige and status. We don't need that. Okay, so in my situation, instead of buying a house, I was single. So what I did was in 1994, I built a publishing company in Natick, Massachusetts. That was 26 years ago. I was a young fellow back then. Okay, um, I created the New England Publishers Association, which became the Independent Publishers of New England in 1998. We had 300 uh, members back then, it's more now. And I had commercial properties in Natick, Framingham, and Westboro. So that was my real estate, okay? Uh, we had a command center. So it was a little bit more established. Instead of offices, we had a command center. Uh, and we moved from Framingham to Westboro. 1998, uh, I was a touring professor. I was the big man on campus. Here's what happened. I trusted the wrong people. I was deceived, manipulated by selfish people. I put money in the wrong places. I was under the influence of jealous people who are intimidated and afraid of my success. The type of people I was around was one, those that had the actions of deception, manipulation, selfishness, those that had the behavior of jealousy, intimidation, and fear, and those who stole my identity and destination of success. They robbed me, okay? I fell into depression with alcohol and sleeping pills, a terrible combination. I was on the doorstep of death. I was addicted to alcohol. I almost had accidental suicide. I was sleeping on the floor of the command center at UN Prime Company in Westboro, Massachusetts. That's true. I was homeless. I was on the floor of a command center in Westboro, Massachusetts, where 222 Turnpike Road, Westboro, Massachusetts. That's where my building was. I was homeless, sleeping on the floor, and I was eating out of cans. I didn't go to AA meetings because I was too drunk to go. Forgot about it. So three words, three words, addiction, suicide, homelessness. I've been there. Addiction, suicide, homelessness. Well, not the completion, but the almost the accidental suicide. That's the doorstep to death. That's what changed me. When I was on the doorstep of death because of greed, I was changed. If that doesn't humble you and make you seek God, then you're a servant to Satan. The National, I'll spend a moment to, to mention, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. Later, I met Mikusita Linda, my beautiful wife, who I met in 2002. Okay, so early on, before I met my wife, I was taught the kind of wife to have. Can you imagine, just imagine, this, this is 18 years ago. Can you imagine at a family reunion in July of uh, 2002, uh, me saying this, hey, I met her three months ago. She's illegal and she doesn't speak English. Yeah, that didn't go well. A month later on my birthday, which was uh, 18 years ago, you know, August 10th, 18 years ago, uh, a month later, I'm going to marry her in two months, okay? After being homeless, addicted, and drunk, I was being delivered. I didn't care of gossip. Forget about it. The gossip, jealousy, and immaturity 
in immaturity, I should say, started to fly as high as an eagle after that. I didn't care. Okay. See, God healed me as I was delivered from greed. Not, I'm not financially rich, but I'm abundantly blessed, which is even better. I have a beautiful, loving wife. I have an education. I have international certifications. I had world-class uh, international awards. If I'm worried about a title, that's okay. I'm an ambassador professor. Prestige, I'm not worried about it, but I'm connected with Harvard University and I'm on the global stage. I have a beautiful church family who I love to visit and make pizza and eat and fellowship with. I'm free from bondage. Um, I'm no longer suffering from addiction or homelessness or having suicidal thoughts. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So picture it. I'm happy as a seagull on the beach with a French fry. I'm so excited for life. So I was finally delivered from greed. What is on my skin is not important. What is in my heart is important. What people see on the outside is not important. What I feel on the inside, the peace, love, and joy, that is important. Okay, the world outside is not important. The inner peace, love, and joy is important. So now let's turn it to our attention to the understanding of greed. The Bible explains that it's not that the rich abandon God, but becoming wealthy raises the possibility. That shows risk from temptation. With wealth comes the temptation to trust in oneself rather than God. The rich sometimes feel that they have no need of God. They have made other arrangements. You see, material things as a threat to the devotion of God is underscored. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 12 through 14, it warns us about entering the promised land, not to allow prosperity to lead to the abandonment of, Lord, of the Lord. And the scripture says, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when you're herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase all you have is multiplied then your heart will become proud and you will forget the lord your god who brought you out of egypt out of the land of slavery yes we are a forgetful people see the bible underscores love trust and service as three core responses of the believer in relation to god and the faults both the idolater and the greedy person for foolishly misdirecting the same three both the idolater and the greedy set hearts on inappropriate objects. Both rely on, trust in, and look to their treasures for protection and blessing. Both serve and submit to things that demean rather than working as a worshiper. Jesus warns about excessive love of wealth and a forbidden service of wealth. No one can be a loyal servant to two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot faithfully serve both God and money. Is greed a religion today? Is greed a religion today? It seems that for many people, material things hold a place in their lives that was once occupied by belief in God. You see, greed is idolatry in that, like literal worship of idols, it represents an attack on God's exclusive rights to human love, trust, and service. Material things can replace God in the human heart and set us on a course that is opposed to him. Economists may recommend greed. Politicians rely on it and celebrate celebrities, I should say, flaunt it. But in the end, like all idols, money fails to deliver on its promises. If the root cause of materialism is misdirected, religious impulses, then the ultimate solution is still faith in the true and living God who alone gives the security and satisfaction that each of us craves. Now, here's a story about greed from false doctrine. And let me tell you, it's a story about how we forget the people and care more about material things. Unfortunately, we are taught material things uh, are good and our actions show it. False doctrine teaches us that. So here's here's an example. I met a guy on the street and asked, hey friend, how come you look like the whole world has caved in? Why do you look so sad? Why do you look so glum? And the sad guy said, let me tell you, three weeks ago an uncle died and left me $50,000. See, an uncle died and, and uh, left him uh, $50,000. And I said, sorry about your uncle. 
He said, hold on, I'm just getting started. Two weeks ago, a cousin I never knew kicked the bucket and left me $95,000 tax-free to boot. Oh, sorry for your cousin, I said. He said, last week my grandfather passed away and I inherited almost a million dollars. Wow, what a tough three weeks. Sorry about your grandfather. You still sad? He says, yeah, this week nothing. <laughs> It's a story where we forget the people and care more about the material things. Unfortunately, we are taught material things are good and our actions show it. Again, we see it in false doctrine. So let's learn about it. Uh, First of Timothy chapter 6 outlines the duties of Christians and their beliefs and also as it pertains to other masters. It speaks of godliness and contentment. It contains a solemn demand for Timothy to be faithful. The chapter closes with the Apostle Paul reiterating a warning to the rich and ends it with a blessing. So rather than re read it, I'm going to read it later, but right now I'm just going to give you a summary, a summary of 1st of Timothy chapter 6 verse 1 through 21 so that you get sort of an umbrella view of 1st of Timothy chapter 6. So verse 1 and 2 says, slavery was part of the Roman world, believing uh, slaves had a responsibility and a testimony to their unbelieving and believing masters. Okay. In verse 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul warns against those who reject sound teaching from Jesus and also his own teaching that bring about godliness. And in uh, verse 6 through 10, the Apostle Paul continues by saying that godliness yields greater gain than money, the love of which brings much evil. And verse 11 through 16, the Apostle Paul reminds Timothy to stay away from greed and instead fight the fight of the faith. Yes, fight the fight. Hold to eternal life and keep the commandment until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to the time of God, the Father chooses. And then in verse 17 through 19, the scripture says, Paul continues with more instructions about money. It is not to be the hope in life, but simply supplied by God to some for enjoyment and, of course, good works. Paul concludes by leaving Timothy with two challenges. Guard what God has entrusted him and to stay out of useless arguments. Okay, so now today our focus is on error and greed. So I'm going to read now 1st of Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 10. 1st of Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 10. So the scripture reads, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And again, that is 1st of Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 10. So I'm going to talk about how you can avoid the pitfalls of the riches. So, and again, we're talking about 1st uh, of Timothy chapter 6. It has been said that there are three things which get a preacher, wealth, wine, and woman. Okay, The Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy is to warn him about the pitfalls of wealth, but it also points to one of those common traits that seem to characterize many false teachers. The inordinate focus upon wealth. Simply put, greed. From the outset, let us agree that there is no spiritual value that is associated with poverty, and there is no inherent wickedness associated with wealth. It is not a sin to be wealthy. Abraham was wealthy. David was wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. Lydia, Philemon, and other godly people in the scriptures 
uh, were wealthy. The problem is not with having the wealth. The problem is making wealth the goal or the, or the aim of our life, like I did in Boston. It is not a problem when we possess wealth, but it becomes a problem when the wealth possesses us. Wealth is a distraction turning us away from good. Again, it's not a problem when we possess wealth, but it becomes a problem when wealth possesses us. Wealth has turned some ministries into a factory of false teachings. Let this be a warning sign. There are three things about false teachings. I will tell you three things about false teachings. Number one, false teachings do not agree with sound words. It's as simple as that. False uh, teachings is usually based on half truth or incomplete truth. Therefore, their words cannot be sound. It could be a false understanding about salvation. Say that salvation comes by work instead of by grace through faith, or that salvation can only come through faith plus works. As some believe you must be baptized in order to be fully saved. That's not true. Okay. So, number two, false teachings do not agree with the words of Jesus. False teachers will often use the words of Jesus, but take them out of context, twist them, distort them, and spin them to fit their own personal agenda. One of the ways we can identify false teachers is by comparing what they said to what the scripture says. If what they say does not line up with scripture, then their teaching is false. And number three, false teachings do not lead to godliness. They do not lead people to a life of reverence to God. They lead only to sin and self, okay? Now I'm going to talk about false teachers and how it causes fierce division in the church. False teachers cause fierce division in the church. Uh, number one, envy. Inward discontent rising from the desire to have what belongs to another. This type of attitude uh, is not of God. Number two, strife and discord. Forget, uh, forgetfulness, hunger, pain, battles, fights, murders, killings, quarrels, lies, disputes, lawlessness, and ruin. Okay. Number three, abusive language. This is the outcome of false teachers. Abusive language. Literally, the word is blasphemies. In this case, not blaspheming God, but one another. False teachers getting people talking about each other, gossiping, spreading tales, telling lies. Uh, number four, evil suspicions, calling one another's motives into questions. Number five, constant friction. This is the state of being where the false teachers are not being confronted. Now let's talk about how false teachers are victims of greed. There are three things, material gain, earthly focus, um, and the greed competition in family. So in number one, material gain. They are deceived into believing that God will make them material, materially rich. That's not the promise of God. Number two, earthly focus. They are deceived into making earth their home instead of what is in heaven. That means your eye is off the prize. And number three, those who desire uh, what, what they have is the desire for money, honestly believe that money will bring them happiness. But it will not. I saw that in Boston. And number four, false sense of ownership. False sense of ownership. They are deceived, uh, uh, they are deceived as to who owns who. Jesus taught that money is one of the spiritual powers we fight, not simply green paper of copper nickel sandwiches. Money is not the same thing. It's someone. And as someone, it tricks us into thinking we master it when inevitably money masters us. Money has a way of binding us into what is physical and temporal and blinding us as to what is spiritual and eternal. It's a bit like a fly in the fly paper. The fly lands on the fly paper and says, my fly paper. When the fly paper says my fly, the fly is dead. It is one thing to have money, another thing for money to have you. When it does, it will kill you. Here's the issue of greed. False teachers in ministry are driven by greed. Their focus is to tickle ears to draw an audience. Greed is a form of idolatry. Idolatry is the worship of an idol or cult image being a physical image, such as a statue or a person in place of God. It's the worship of something or someone other than God as if it were God. That's how cults arise. So here's a story of how greed distracts us. It's a funny story. So this rich yuppie opens the door of his BMW when suddenly a truck comes along and hits the door and rips it off the car completely. 
When the police arrive at the scene, this rich kid was complaining bitterly about the damage to his precious BMW. The rich kid says, officer, look at what they have done to my Beamer, you know, his BMW. He cried, he whined. And the police say, you yuppies are so materialistic. You make me sick, said the police officer. You're so worried about your stupid BMW that you didn't even notice that your left arm was ripped off along with the door. And the rich kid says, oh, replied. His reply was, and finally noticing the bloody left shoulder where his arm once was. And he says, where's my Rolex watch? <laughs> so here's how we can talk about greed in a secular way. Let's understand greed in a secular way and what the mindset is like. Many greedy people obsessively pursue wealth as a substitute for what they feel is lacking inside them. But they ignore the high price that comes with greediness, a stunted life. And that was the path I was heading when I was in Boston. Materialistic pursuits are often an attempt at relieving emotional discomfort. In fact, the behavior of greedy people can be compared to that of substance abusers. But just like drugs, material possessions can never provide the comfort and reassurance we all crave. On the contrary, the greedier we become, the more uh, advanced on the path of self-destruction we are on. Unfortunately, amid our busyness, we rarely stop to ask ourselves, why am I frantically pursuing wealth? We have to ask ourselves that question. So greed is not so much of a financial issue. It is the symptom of a troubled mind trying to link self-worth to financial worth, usually on a subconscious level. That's how it's programmed in the 1970s. I told you that. Far too often, greed comes with stress, exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and despair. Many view greed and its related traits, such as ambition and material success, as desirable rather than a potential mental health problem. You see, it is not always easy to explain the harm caused by excessive greed. Greed has unpleasant effects in our inner emotional lives. The anxiety and restlessness we feel when we long for some possession and the false assurance that upon gaining it will put at ease and satisfaction places us in a literally vicious circle. We get lost. See, greed is idolatry as well as a distraction. Greed is an excessive love or desire for money or any possession. Greed is not merely caring about money or possessions, but caring too much about them. The greedy person is too attached to his things and his money, or he desires more money and more things in an excessive way. So let's talk about how we can be convicted and put into a state of repentance and go down a better path out of darkness and into light. Number one, believers must consciously realize the Lord owns everything they have. It's as simple as that. They are merely stewards of their possessions. Purchases should be evaluated as to how they would advance the kingdom or make one's ministry more effective. Number two, believers must cultivate a thankful heart. Since God owes them nothing, anything they receive from God should make them thankful. Thank you, God, for my home. Thank you, God, for my car. Thank you, God, for my job, for example. Number three, believers must learn to distinguish between one, I should say, they must learn to distinguish wants from needs. That principle, if followed, would greatly increase the amount of money available for the Lord's work. Do you want something or do you need it? What you want, you probably don't need and therefore should not buy. And so that way you're not short on money. Number four, believers must discipline themselves to spend less than they make. The ease of buying things on credit has become a severe temptation. Look what happened in uh, the housing bubble. As a result, many people are so hopelessly mirrored in debt that they will never get out. And number five, believers must give sacrificially to the Lord. Laying up treasure in heaven for the work of the kingdom should be their highest joy and source of greatest reward. Today, we talked about first of Timothy, focusing on the, the chapter six, uh, verse three through 10. We were understanding greed. We were learning to avoid the pitfalls of the riches. We talked about three things 
uh, um, that cause fierce division from false teachers. Um, and then false teachers being the victims of greed, the issue of greed, that greed is an idolatry. And then we wrapped up by talking about the repentance for correction away from greed. These are the things that we talked about today. Remember that the doorstep to death caused by greed is the addiction, the suicide, the homelessness. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. Remember on September 18th, 2020, the Bravehearted Men's Ministry Extravaganza, you know, like that? It's titled is Your Identity is Your God-Given Purpose. Um, we're excited for that. My name is David Ewan, heading up the Bravehearted Ministry at 1060 Worcester Street in Springfield, Massachusetts with pastors Jose and Millie Martinez. Our website is resurrectionspringfield.org. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TRC413. Uh, you can also subscribe to us on ResSense Spring on YouTube. We're on the kradio.com, resurrectioncenterradio.com, uh, ktv.us. Join us Sundays at noon and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.